Oops, all zeros. Oops. Hello. Welcome to Security Cryptography Whatever. I'm Deirdre. I'm David. And uh, nowadays I actually work for Google, so that obliges me to say that this podcast is not the opinions of Google. Yay! Congratulations! <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you don't pay attention to my Twitter, which I don't recommend paying attention <laughs> to my Twitter, you uh, probably missed. I started as a product manager on Chrome Security yes. uh, a little under a month ago. And so, you know, I'm excited to be uh, adding a lot of value <laughs> to your organization. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, we we consumers of the most popular browser on the planet, mostly because of Android, uh, wish you the best of luck because our security is in your hands, as it were. Um, thank you. And I don't know that we've I don't know what numbers are public about that usage. So. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, today we saw a cool meme going around on Twitter, and we decided to just jump on that and talk about it on the pod because we think these cancelable crypto takes are ranging from spicy to milk milk toast. <laughs> yeah, so Tony Arciri um, at Bascule on mm. Twitter, B-A-S-C-U-L-E. That's mm. probably a reference to something, but I don't know. <laughs> Posted, we're canceling each other over cryptography takes today. Post your cancelable cryptography take. And we'll link the tweet in the show notes. Mm-hmm. And this was on April 8th, 2022. And we are recording on April 10th, 2022. Mm-hmm. And hopefully this podcast comes out soon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see when it comes out. One of the ones that we'll go with first that I was amused by as what. So this this came out. And I was like, cool, cool. Let's 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 see let's see what people come up with. And like a lot of the replies that I saw were not cancelable takes. They were good takes and they should not be canceled. And I was like, wait, am I getting the meme backwards? <laughs> like is this, is this sort of meta where it's like post your cancelable take and you put you post the good take and everyone gives you credit and shit. But finally David Adrian posted what I would say might be a cancelable take which is that agility is necessary for TLS. And my first instinct is no. The, <laughs> the only agility you need in your TLS negotiation is in the protocol number. So, yeah, canceled. <laughs> so this, this take actually goes back to, uh, to my PhD defense um, oh. with our previous guest, Chris Pikert, he was actually the person that fo- kind of forced me backwards on this um, during the Q&A. And so when I was defending my PhD, and I guess we could even link the slides in the show notes, mm. uh, one of the things that, you know, was versioning the protocol rather than having agility. Mm-hmm. Because the the connection to measurement there, which is what my uh, PhD thesis is about, was about is that basically anything that's measurable about a protocol is something that can go wrong, right? If you have okay. agility, that means you can measure like what the things, what ciphers or algorithms a host supports. And then usually like within a protocol, anything that you can measure is in fact a knob and any knob is something mm-hmm. that can go wrong. So I was making the argument that like, there's also a loose correlation between like measuring a protocol, being able to measure a protocol a- in practice and like the chance that it would go wrong. Because mm-hmm. if you look at WireGuard, there's not really anything mm-hmm. to measure. There's like, oh, that's a wire guard host. And that's it. And then because you need to know the key in advance anyway, you only find them if right, you're scanning. Yeah. So that was one of the things that I said was, you know, versioning good, agility bad. <laughs> and then Chris was like, but there's absolutely no way that you're going to be able to get everyone to upgrade on the internet all at once. So you're going to have to support at least two versions Mm. and so what do you do then and so i think even a better version of that kind of take is if you just admit that within the public internet there's going to be at least two classes of devices let's say there's phones and there's desktops and on phones we generally like 
cryptography that can be done fast on an ARM CPU. Mm -hmm. And on desktops, we tend to like cryptography that can be done fast on an Intel CPU. Mm -hmm. And in practice, that tends to turn into things done in software on phones and things done with AES instructions on Intel CPUs, mm -hmm. which is why you see like Cha Cha Poly on mobile phones. And then you'll see AES GCM or whatever the current hot variant of AES <laughs> is <SIV>. um, <laughs> on uh, on desktops mm -hmm. because all the Intel desktops have the AES and I instructions mm -hmm. um, and phones mostly don't. So I will say ARM version 8 has some really cool instructions that you can use to do like XORs of multiple words at once mm -hmm. in the same way that mm -hmm. uh, SHA-3 and other sponge constructions tend to do. Nice. So that'll be really cool when... ARM 8 is actually in small devices. And now but. that we have more laptop devices that have an ARM core inside them, maybe it'll just kind of smooth out across multiple device classes. So, but anyway, yes, we, up yeah. until recently, we've had dual classes and we've had to dual wield our ciphers mostly mm -hmm. because of mm -hmm. microarchitecture. But I mean, it's microarchitecture, I would say, is the implementation detail yes, in this it is. case. Yes. Right. It's, it's you have multiple classes of devices and you have, you know, you're not gonna get everyone to upgrade all at once. And so I think in the public internet world, you need to have a small amount of agility. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, you know, like TLS won three levels of agility where there's basically like two options for ciphers and two options oh, for signatures. Okay. Well, there's more than that. Yes. But you go AES or you go cha cha poly plus or minus some key lengths. Mm -hmm. You do an RSA signature or you do an ECDSA signature. And then there's a couple of groups, I think, that people use for key exchange. Mm. And so. So is so that presupposes that within a single version, within TLS 1.3, you have agility for your key exchange, your signature, your, for your cipher suite in total. And the agility here is just like two things, maybe. Your cipher, you might have AES, you might have Cha Cha Poly. Your, your key exchange, you might have, I think they left in, uh, was it they left in finite field? I think they got rid of finite field completely. They got rid of finite field, I think. Okay, good. Um, and signatures. May maybe it's specified, but like it's not considered to be supported. I th the the only reason I forget is I know the banks were using it for auditing or something like that, and they wanted to have a hard coded finite field like key or something like that. I forget, but anyway, this is like agility within a single version mm -hmm. up until TLS one point three, and even still, it's basically been like almost everyone supports TLS one point zero and TLS one point two because if you can't support one point two like you basically are left with 1.0 because 1.1 is somewhere in the middle and it's this bimodal set of device classes. If you support one, you don't support the other, so you have to support the two of them. Does that kind of turn it from crypto agility of having multiple versions of TLS into one version of TLS, but agility within that one version? Is it just kind of moving the ball? Well, so... The version negotiation was always worse than like the extension yeah. or cipher negotiation for some definition of worse. Because the well, extension that's probably not actually I might even walk that back because there are probably <laughs> more vulnerabilities with uh and then in terms of like oops, now there's plain text with the cipher negotiation, but oh. like the version negotiation has never been like secure. There's there are so many ways to downgrade it. Yeah. And yeah. So they, the workaround with that is like a specific implementation behavior and then moving the version negotiation to an extension, which oh, then right. kind of turns the cipher negotiation and the version negotiation all kind of work more or less mm -hmm. the same way now if because you squint at it. Now it's like pinned to the last TLS 1.2 version, right? In like the, the top level where you used to do version negotiation. And now it's literally... What mm -hmm. ones do you support in a set and you find an intersection of sets between the server and the client, right? Something yeah, like that. Yeah, specific uh, things that you add in if you've done a downgrade at the end to signal that you've been downgraded. Yeah. And when you're doing 1.3, you set the, ver the, the version number in the packet to 1.2 and then yeah. you set your yeah. actual supported version in an extension to 1.3. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so and hacky. And then there's a, been a bunch of really, really clever like bit mangling to make it so that 
So that was in the client hello. The client hello is basically the same, right? We've just yeah. added an extension. Yeah. And the server hello, if it's speaking TLS 1.3, there's people did some really, really clever byte stuff to make it TLS 1.3.1 still look like a TLS 1.2.1 yeah. if you didn't know that 1.3 existed, but <laughs> kind of everything meaning different things. <laughs> well, not quite meaning different things, but yeah. some stuff zeroed out. And mm-hmm. then you'd think about it with your 1.3 hat on rather than your 1.2. Okay. So I don't know that, like, I would consider all of that to be agility, whether it's version negotiation or or cipher negotiation, because mm. version and those are kind of the same thing. And, like, the way you do it with no agility is you pick the version that you support, and then, like, that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or you have separate endpoints for each version, and then you, like, you maintain both for some amount of time, and then you turn off the old one when you mm-hmm. can. Which is totally reasonable to do for your VPN. I would say... You are not canceled today. <laughs> I've been canceled, but it's unrelated. Okay. <laughs> for this uh, for this take, okay, yeah. At least in the way this is done in TLS 1.3, I prefer this quote-unquote agility outside of the version level than what TLS had before, which was trying to do agility at the version level and the extension level. I don't know. It's fine. <laughs> Cryptographic agility in other places is just so fraught. So Yeah. If you're not TLS, I don't think you should have any agility. Yeah. Cool. All right. What do we got? We've got another one. This is from Nick Sullivan from Cloudflare. And he says, Cryptography projects driven by a single highly opinionated person are cult objects, not foundations for an industry. And I don't even know if this is like a cancelable take. It's just sort of true. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, I think there's a lot of nuance or missing information in that tweet. Mm. That, I mean, uh, if, if Thomas were here, he would be like, well, I don't think IETF CFRG is a foundation <laughs> for an industry either. Fair. It's kind of tough because... Here's my interpretation. There's like a whole family of cryptography that is considered both good, but also it's like all affiliated with DJB, Dan Bernstein. Dan Bernstein's introduced a lot of good new cryptography where new is in like the past 10, 15 years. And it's new and better compared to kind of AESGCM compared to the original elliptic curves like P56 and the NIST curves, the short wire stress curves with incomplete formulas, and they have various foot guns and they're slower and all this sort of stuff. Let's leave aside any of the sort of things we've talked about, about Edwards curves, curves with cofactors, that sort of stuff. They're generally considered an improvement. It's all DJB crypto. It's all like crypto from like one guy and even if it's all pretty good it generally has a a little bit of a vibe that's just sort of like let us do everything that this one guy says and we will be secure and it's like okay (laughs) like is that what we want to do (laughs) how like i know some of how that played out right because like x25519 was like oh somewhere in the 08 range when that was published i want to say yes oh six maybe 10 on the later side yeah which like if you think about the state of the internet right like 2010 was when that one firefox extension came out that Mm, way right I think it had sheep in the name or something. I don't fire know, but it sheep. let you pick up a uh, yeah, fire sheep. Yep. It let you pick up cookies off of Wi-Fi, and basically it was for logging into other people's Facebooks. Mm-hmm. Because no one was using TLS. It's kind of what caused Facebook to switch to HTTPS. Yep. And you know, around the same time, like I don't know when Google switched to HTTPS. I don't know, like, a lot of people were certainly involved. I don't know, like, how much of it was was driven by, like, Adam Langley. But, like, mm. we know that, like, Adam wrote the Donna Curve 25519 library. Yep. The C library. Google. Yep. Um, and then open source that. And then mm-hmm. that was the basis for a lot of other implementations. Yes. There's a ton of uh, Curve 25519 implementations in many languages that are kind of downstream descendants of the Donna library. I don't know why they would have done that for TLS at the time. Like, that doesn't make sense. Mm. Right, because it wasn't 
two five five one nine wasn't a no uh, yeah uh, the part of TLS for a while. The IETF spec for that came out at least in twenty at late after twenty sixteen or something like that. And so, but I think that action is one of the things that kind of popularized uh, two five five one nine. And then at the same time, people were worried about the patent situation around some of the, mm, yeah. the NIST curves. I think even though it, well it, they either don't apply or they've expired or they've been said they don't apply or all combination thereof. The patents had to do with point compression, not the curves oh, themselves. Oh, yeah, you're right. There was a BlackBerry patent on mm-hmm. stupid point compression. And it was just like, it's just literally like have this bit set to like one zero or like negative one or whatever for whether you're including, if you have a, an elliptic curve point in a fine coordinates, it's like X and Y. If it's on a curve, you can just say whether it's on the plus or minus side or your Y. And yeah. like you can just eliminate, you know, 255 bits of uh, of data and just have plus minus or whatever. And someone at BlackBerry who in the early, I don't know, early 2000s or late 90s was doing elliptic curve stuff, patented this technique and you couldn't use it for a long time. Something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't I don't know the details there and I don't want to speculate. But right, I think that trend kind of pushed people towards uh, some of the DJB stuff. And mm. then thinking back to like 2014-ish, mm-hmm. like it was all the rage by then. You were starting to see, I don't know when Cha Cha Pally was published, but like that was yeah, going on Android. That was when like, oh, what if we use these on mobile phones? Yeah. Especially because RC4, like... Oh, God, yeah. RC4 kind of went out of phase in the 2012-2014 range. Like, people knew it had issues, but people didn't really care about that until, well, 2014. And then CBC mode is getting, Mm -hmm. you know, it's shit kicked out of it by by everybody. Um, And there's all the beast stuff from Ty. Yeah. And so I think that's just, just people are looking for alternatives. And what you had was AES, GCM, and Cha Cha. Cha Cha Pally, which mm-hmm. are both effectively stream ciphers. I do have to say that, like, a lot of his, a lot of these, like, original publications, like the original, the original, you know, Curve to Five Five One Nine, and then later at Two Five Five One Nine, and I forget when the Cha Cha Pally stuff started getting published, but it was ready and it was fast, and that you could do it in software for the Cha Cha Pally stuff, as opposed to needing instructions to make it fast. And then Snowden happened and people are already a little suspicious about oh, yeah. they were they were a little bit like these NSA curves or these NIST curves. They're not really NSA curves, but like they have they've randomly hashed some value to get a coefficient um, in some of these NIST curves. And people were always just sort of like we would like more information about how these curve parameters were determined. And then Snowden and, you know, all this stuff with dual EC which was another yeah. NIST standard that we have strong evidence that uh, NSA was fiddling around with this random number generator that had elliptic curves uh, inside it. Uh, a one-two punch on dual EC because there was yeah. the like 20, circa 2013, maybe early 2014, like where someone directly connected like this thing from Snowden and like this action at RSA, the company, yeah. and oh, dual God. EC. Yeah. Like they paid... RSA company to put dual EC in, something Mm -hmm. like that. I don't recall. And then in 2015, or late 2015, there was the Juniper, oops, Mm. our dual EC parameters got changed in our source and we don't know why. In our our Um, VPN software and like, you know, you can speculate as to who, but it was just like they were able to go in, make a change to your software and like, oh, look, see, they just changed like pieces of your internal dual EC parameters that theoretically would let them backdoor all of your VPN traffic because yeah. they're able to predict your your nonces and all your random numbers. The conspiracy theory there is uh, that plus BGP hijacks is what got people into uh, OPM. I oh, believe. shit. Really? There's I didn't even that, think... I, there's a crew of people that think that. I didn't even related. think it was like that. You didn't even need to be that hardcore <laughs> to get um, yeah, I don't know. but uh so to, this is just kind of all context for why people were ready to dis 
trust NIST stuff like the NIST curves and move to something that came from not NIST, not NSA influence, not, you know, patents possibly encumbered, you know, not all this stuff that were basically the only options in town up until uh, all this sort of stuff started kind of coming to a head. And then this guy who has a historical record of going to war with the government, so he's definitely not in league with NIST or the NSA or anything like that. Yeah, he sued the government about the export restrictions back in the mid-90s. The result of Bernstein versus whoever is basically what says that, you know, code is speech. And so it's regulated like you would regulate speech in the United States, which is pretty cool. Anyway, his cryptography, considered good and fast and performant and not encumbered by all of these sort of forces, becomes very, very attractive. Unfortunately, it's kind of just him doing doing a lot of great research and publicizing a ton of great stuff. And then it just becomes kind of like a one man show. His research has led people to come up with all sorts of new curves and to iterate on stuff like Cha Cha Poly and we have new hash functions and, and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And at the same time, like from like 20, we'll say 13 through like 16 ish, I think mm. the cryptocurrency people <laughs> got very <laughs> interested in speeding up some of a subset of the NIST curves. And I believe some of those yeah. speed ups that applied to the ones that you see in TLS Yep, for Bitcoin. But yes, sec, sec P56K1 is mm -hmm. a NIST curve. Uh, it just wasn't a very popular NIST curve until mm -hmm. uh, some dude picked it for his uh, signing mm -hmm. algorithm in Bitcoin. And it became very, very popular <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and but highly like, optimized. As a result now, and I, th I think <clears throat> I remember, I want to say Matt Green at some point, like tweeting about this. In 2010, you never would have expected, like, there to be a solid, like, NIST P-curve library in every language on every platform. Yeah. And by, like, 2016, if not 2014, there was one everywhere. Yep. Um, yeah. Even Java. Yep. <laughs> even Java. <laughs> Thanks, Bitcoin. I mean, like, you know, people give shit to cryptocurrency, but it's actually produced lots of interest in good cryptographic implementations and it's just overflowed to all the other elliptic curve cryptography that we've yeah. been using so that's that's a boon but yeah for for this take i'm not i'm not saying he's wrong like i don't think it's a very cancelable opinion not uh, not foundations for an industry i mean i don't i don't know like a lot of a lot of good analysis has been done for the Edwards curves and Montgomery curves. I think I'm less familiar with the Cha-Cha poly, uh, polycrypt analysis, but I think we've kind of realized that yes, these complete formulas with really fast uh, speeds that give us, you know, X only arithmetic. And we, we have a lot of benefits from the curves that DGB came up with, but I think we're realizing the cofactors are also very sharp edges but we're learning from that too. So, yeah. Academia is great for enabling. Like you, the foundation yeah. of the industry in the sense that it oh, enables yeah. the industry to exist. New foundations in cryptography, whatever the name of the paper about this, that introduced like Diffie-Hellman for sure. Very, oh, yeah. Like, that type of stuff is amazing, right? Yeah. But it's not necessarily clear to me that like... Uh, especially as someone who's done an academic and like implementation focused academic work in the past that you really want what the academics are doing to be foundational in the sense of like mm. of like engineering foundational to uh, to what industry is doing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the flip side of that, I would say for academics is to like be very wary of pitching like your thing as the real world or like foundational engineering thing unless you're really mm. sure it is. Like I think that's been a common criticism across a lot of the stuff in uh, with regard to like Ed two five five one nine and so on that like it gets pitched as here's the super fast, super usable 
elliptic curve uh, algorithm, but actually mm-hmm. the spec is in the code and good mm-hmm. luck running it. And it uses a custom assembler. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you look at the code and it's slightly different than the paper and there is no other technical specification. And you're like, which one am I supposed to do? And there's no security analysis of the thing that's actually implemented. And yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I don't think it should be like on academia to necessarily provide all those things, but you probably shouldn't be framing your thing as like foundational engineering if you're not. Yeah. To sort of like, Um, my research results solves all of your problems and you don't need to do anything else with it other than just like take it and slot it in your, you know, TLS library or whatever it is. One thing that I kind of want people to kind of approach when they're doing anything with cryptography in terms of like, hey, this is a new curve or a new primitive or a new vert, like a new thing. You know the application in your system that you're trying to, what you're trying to do in the context of your system, whether it's TLS or a messaging library or whatever your software is. It's kind of on you to do the security analysis of the new thing within the full context of the system because you have to analyze above the abstraction boundary and below the abstraction boundary because that's where the security bugs lie. And the author of a paper who's just trying to get a good result and get it accepted at some conference or journal is not able to do that for you because they just do not have the same context. So there's only so much that the author of new whiz bang crypto primitive can do for you. They can't do your entire job for you. So be careful. Yeah. Touching on this take, I think, because we were talking about the cofactors curves, our recent guest, Sophie Schmieg, also okay. also has a, a small spicy take, which is that Did we uh, release her episode? I don't no! think we've released the episode uh, with her yet. It's it's Sorry. literally on my laptop and I swear it'll get out. Probably after real world crypto. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, spicy take. P56 is fine. And cofactor problems are way more severe than having to check for a point on the curve. And I'm I'm willing to say this is not a cancelable take, although some people may think that. And like if you told me that in 2016, I might have agreed with you. I might have agreed that this is a cancelable take. But I do think it's kind of hard to look at P56 with incomplete formulas, which is what we had when Edwards curves and and cofactor curves were basically introduced with Edwards curves, cofactor curves that do have complete formulas, but you have to deal with cofactors in your code and like wherever you're slotting your curve into, uh, whether it's a signature or a key exchange or whatever that, whatever you're doing with it. It's kind of apples and oranges. And I would re- like, it's hard to really do a good analysis of like, well, incomplete formulas mean you have to check their points on curves and you have to do all these checks versus cofactors. You have to do other checks, not necessarily the points on the curve, but that you're multiplying out the cofactor only when you need to. I'm doing a library right now where you have to do cofactors for only some of your operations uh, or else your verification is bad in, in slightly different ways. If you limit it to just signature verification, how, like, I haven't dealt much with, like, at the level in which the cofactors matter that much because mm-hmm. if you're just in signature verification, the effective result is you end up with more than one, there's more than one valid signature for a given input. One thing that that is annoying is that you can be you can verify a signature fine if you're just verifying it one at a time, even if you don't multiply out the cofactor. But if you're verifying them in batches, you will get a different result if you don't handle the cofactor. This is for sh- signatures like EDDSA. And when you are in a blockchain setting where verifying signatures is cr- crucial to consensus, this is very bad. This is just yeah. one of them. There's there's other things where it's just sort of like when you write protocols that assume a prime order group and you're using a non-prime order curve, you have and you're trying to target a prime order subgroup. And then, the, you know, if you, you factor out the order of the prime order group from the non-prime order curve, you get a non-prime order cofactor. The, the abstraction mismatch 
just t- tends to bite you in very subtle ways, such as, yeah. Definitely. So that's kind of the thing that pops up. If you're not, like, building it as part of some other protocol where these happen, and, like, how, like, like let's put our 2010 hats on when Bitcoin existed, but no one cared about it. <laughs> like, you're just doing, like, were people doing batch signature verification? Like, what are applications of batch signature verification that aren't blockchains? Um... Um, like what were, was there, was anyone doing anything with these curves besides just individual signature verification? Cofactor curves? Uh, Yeah, with like an Edwards curve. Oh, um. With like Ed25519. Key exchange is the one that I think of first. Key exchange, long-term keys for like signal protocol or something like Mm -hmm. that. Things that aren't necessarily, uh, batching. Having the X25519 byte based this is how you do Diffie Hellman with a Montgomery curve thing that DJB published as part of Curve to 509 was very good because it kind of took a because it has to do with clamping and getting rid of the cofactor for you explicitly and kind of this ugly way of just shoving off some of the bits it got rid mm-hmm. of the cofactor for you but it was explicitly described how to do Diffie-Hellman with this curve in a way that handled the cofactor for you. That was very good because it could you could very easily see a scenario of you just slotting in this curve with a, a cofactor of four uh, into regular schmegular Diffie-Hellman that you used to do with, mm-hmm. I don't know, P56 or, you know, whatever, and just not handling the cofactor and someone gives you a point of low order as their public key and then you're just multiplying, you know, your secret scalar over, you know, the identity plus minus four or something like that. And it just falls out for you. But he didn't do that by default. He's like, here's how you do it. And it has all of these, you know, ponies that go with it. It's very fast. You don't have to do all these extra checks because it's only over the X coordinate. You don't have to worry about you know, all these other things and it's complete. But yeah. I could definitely see a world in like 2010 or whatever where someone tries to use these new whiz bang curves in Diffie-Hellman and these low order point attacks just kind of fall out of it. And I wish Thomas was here because he would have something much more concrete uh, to say about that. But anyway, I I mostly agree with, with Sophie's take, especially now because we have better complete formulas for these NIST curves like P56. They are still slower than the Edwards and Montgomery curves that have cofactors, but they're complete and they're nice and they're still very fast. And you can do the prime order curves. You can do all this stuff. These curves are built are built into every single library, basically. Um, you can use them for the Bitcoin curve. But I really would like kind of like a holistic apples to oranges analysis of like, say you have prime order curves that use these maybe they're incomplete or maybe they're complete in slower formulas versus the kind of vulnerabilities you get with these cofactor curves that are complete, but you have to deal with cofactors, kind of a systemization of knowledge of like, yes, you have different vulnerability classes, but like how game over are they and how common do they show up and how much work is it to mitigate them and that sort of stuff. I think I would like to see that. And if that exists, someone tweet me or ping me with it. I would like to read it. I would just add that I think the world, my point is that the world changed and that we got the complete formulas for, for the NIST curves. Yeah. But I think also at the same time, the world changed and that now we have way more use cases or yes. way more um, drive for the use cases yeah. where you would use these these Montgomery curves and then um, shoot yourself in the foot yeah. than we did prior. So I, yeah. I think there, there's two effects happening there. That is that is a very good point. It used to be very much like you have a certificate signature and you have key exchange in TLS and it's all for TLS or VPN or, you know, an app install that you're verifying a, a mm-hmm. developer certificate or something like that. And now we have a lot more things happening uh, with these curves than we originally, with, with both mm-hmm. kinds of curves than we originally thought. Okay, do we want to go to the next one? Yeah, I think Andrew Wally, also from Chrome, um, makes a great point that nonces develop an attractive patina over time, similar to (laughs) copper, so they should be, in fact, reused as often as possible. (laughs) And, you know, I agree with this take, and I think Chip and Joanne do as well. We all love an attractive patina and some shiplap. (gasps) Oh, my God. I know he's trolling, but... Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> no, so a number, a nonce, is a number you use once and once, nonce. And there's also a nonce slang term in the UK for which is just like a dumb person or whatever. But yeah, no, no. not once, no. <laughs> as many times as you want. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Yeah, they should not, in fact, be reused as often as possible. Although it's funny. Is it really being reused? I mean, it technically is. Is it really being reused if you are generating a new nonce every time? You're just generating the same nonce every time because you're bad at generating nonces. <laughs> like all zeros or something like that. Yeah. Oops, all zeros. Oops, all zeros. All right. Uh, My nonce is always four. <laughs> is that an XKCD? I think that's a Yeah, that's yeah. the XKCD get random number. Classic. Chosen by dice roll. <laughs> Guaranteed to be random. We also have Lucas Meyer saying timing attacks don't really matter. Mm. My amend to that is that timing attacks are either like so incredibly trivial and obvious that like they poop the key out immediately <laughs> or they don't really matter. That's kind of kind of been my take. But, you know, I never learned how uh, Spectre and Meltdown actually work. So, well, there's I'm sure Chris Palmer would yell at me. There's there's the micro architectural speculation attacks. That's one bag. What's that's one bag of bits, uh, literally. And then there's like the literally. Do you have a constant time algorithm? And can I just like look at like w like I can just listen to your laptop, or I can you know look at how fast you respond, and I can use that information as part of a timing attack. And like like if you look at a power analysis, one of the coolest things that you know usually if you slap some AI on a thing, you're just like okay, fuck it, whatever. You just you know that's you just want to slap some AI on it. One of the cool things from some other Google researchers is they literally train an AI on power recordings of, I think one was AES and another one was like ECDSA. And they could literally just feed a new one to the trained AI and it'd be like, oh yeah, here's like 200 bits of this 256 uh, was it, curve. Was it Ellie that did this? That sounds yes. like something that Ellie yeah, would do. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's just like, yes, it's just, you know, especially when you were able to train, um, train an AI to do it for you. It used to be that you would get like a, like a power analysis or a recording and you would just be able to look at it and be like, oh, look, that is like bit one, bit two, or like block one, block two or something like that. And you can see like the bits just on the spectrograph or, you know, whatever, um, oscilloscope graph or something like that and just be like look those are the bits it's like it's either a zero or a one for you know 256 of them uh depending on your secret key and it just falls out so for that sort of stuff i'm like yes it kind of does matter but it does depend on how they're measuring if it's so latent that they can measure it over the network you're kind of in a shit position Sometimes it has to be over the local network, but if it's not necessarily over the local network, like what are you doing? But you not, do not necessarily need to do have a constant time algorithm to protect against that. It might be a different layer in your system that you have to defend against that timing attack. Yeah. But when it comes to like, you have to put, you know, a sensor and slap it on the wall next to your laptop in the other office from you to record this power analysis and then either, you know, look at it with human eyes or feed it into this trained AI to, like, get the AES key out of it. You have to... This is to... why we invented literal locks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you need to look at your threat model and see <laughs> if that is within your threat model. And I think when it comes to that sort of stuff, which is, like, if you have an implementation of a crypto library and you don't know where someone's going to deploy it and it's possible that they're going to deploy it in a scenario where yes, those sort of attackers are within your threat model. Then you just sort of want to do a little bit of belt and suspenders if you can afford it. And you probably can afford it yeah, um, in you terms of be performance. Writing, like constant time, right. like al uh, algorithms and curve operations and so yeah. on. But like we can do that. I don't know that in most now. cases I would be worried beyond that. Yeah. 
But when it comes to the like speculative execution stuff or all these microarchitectural leaks that like well, with Spectre and Meltdown. Multi-tenancy is just hard. Yeah. <laughs> If you're worried about that in the cloud, like there's a lot of other things you need to be worried about if, in the multi yeah, cloud. Not, <laughs> if you're not, if you're at the point where like you're worried about Spectre because of yeah. multi tenancy, like like if you can't, if you're not someone who can actually worry about Spectre and do something about it, you probably just yeah. shouldn't be doing multi tenant things anyway. Yeah. Yeah. If you are actually worried about that sort of attack, like you should be racking your own hardware. Yeah. Like you're someone who can deal with that or yes. you need to you need to be spitting up a lot more machines. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So like oh, for crypto implementations, you can probably belt and suspender it for other sort of timing attacks. One thing that I was very happy to introduce to my spouse, who is a computer architect and, and rants about yet another microtechnical leak paper, Spectre Meltdown came out and he's like, oh, no, there's just going to be like a dime a dozen of these. And he was right, because it's like other micro architects talking to other micro architects be like, did you know that there's a leak in the look aside buffer? And they're like, yes, we designed the yeah. look aside buffer. We know that they all are leaking like sieves because we designed the fucking thing to give you a fast computer. Yeah, but, on the plus um, side, all those extra ones got a couple people I know. Let them finish their PhD. Yeah, so it's fine. <laughs> See, pluses and minuses. I was watching a talk by Alex Stamos ages ago where he was basically saying, like, here is the pyramid of bad things that can happen to people, you know, on the Internet. Phishing, abuse, like spam, like, you know, tons and tons and stuff of like using systems as they are designed um, but, you know, using them badly. And like at the very tippy tippy top of the pyramid is like, you know, side channel attacks, speculative execution, zero days, like the things that are extremely expensive to run, extremely fragile, and you have to be extremely targeted to pull them off. And so I was like, hey, Nathan, someone agrees with you. And he's like, yes. And he's been showing that slide in his own classes about speculative execution since now. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I mostly agree with you that like these are things we should not completely discount, but also they are very expensive to actually leverage against a target. And so we should keep all of that in mind when we're spending our risk budget on things. I think the more interesting question in that space is, like, what do you do to address that kind of stuff and mm. less about, like, what the next flavor of one is and that specific mm -hmm. mitigation. Mm -hmm. Because um, they they kind of look and smell alike a lot. Yeah. Unfortunately, the last person that I asked about this who was on the attack side was not at all interested in answering that side of the question. And <laughs> so, <laughs> alas. Alas. I'm sure other people are. Mm -hmm. But I believe they're the micro-architects um, <laughs> for the most part. I have to give a shout out to CHERRY, which I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's basically trying to not rebuild from the ground up kind of micro-architecture implement architecture implementations in a more secure, less leaky way. But everyone that I've talked to, including, you know, micro-architect spouse, says, yes, CHERRY is trying to do a holistic re-examination of how to do these systems in a less leaky way. That's not just sort of one-off, 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 like, let's just fix the look aside buffer. It's like, okay, you fixed like one leak out of, you know, a hundred. I would probably get slapped, but I'd have to call out. I know people at Michigan are working on it. And I know that like Matthew Hicks, who's now at Virginia uh, yeah. Tech, has been working on like more secure to timing attack on micro architectures. Nice. Cool. And like hardware mitigations to, for control flow stuff yeah. um, for a while. So people are working on it. Cool. Very good. I mean, this is like over 40, 50 years of like how we've been building processors and designing these implementations and hardware. And now we have to be like, no, 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 no. Like you, you can't do that anymore. And it's like, okay, yeah. if we stop doing all of that, like you cut your processor performance in like half. So it's like, okay, now we have to figure out how to like get it back without being leaky all over the place. So it's like a, it's a very fundamental change. And so, you know, Godspeed to all those researchers who are trying to chart a new path. Another take from Eleanor uh, is their their display name. Additive notation is clearly correct. I don't think this is a cancelable take. I think this is a correct take. <laughs> this is coming back to 
abstract algebra. I think it depends on whether or not you need to do a, a exponentiation or not. Yes. <laughs> Like so, how many how many layers of operations are you doing? Is yes. it just one or two? Yes. Multiplicative. Uh, Once you're at three or four, <laughs> maybe you want to start at additive. Lest we be breaking out the up arrows. Actually, I was I would be going in the opposite direction. Like if you're so just for a little context, like if you're doing group operations in an abstract group, abstract algebra group, you can either represent the group operation as a plus. So like you add group elements together as the group operation. Uh, this is additive notation, or you can represent it as you multiply uh, elements together, and this is you know multiplicative notation. Multiplicative no notation is very common when you're doing classic finite field Diffie-Hellman, where you have g to yeah. the a, and then you multiply, it, yeah, you know, and you take g to the a to the b, and you get g to the a b, and that's your shared you know shared secret stuff like that. And it's popular because that's the literal operation you're doing. Like yes. you, you'll see both in like intro groups too. Because if yes. you look at like, uh, you, you might see like the additive numbers mod yeah. p as well. Like yeah. there's groups where you add them together. Yeah. Where the operation is literally addition, and then yeah. you usually, it's frustrating when you have an add and the operation is actually just a normal multiply. Yes. What we think of as multiply or vice versa. Yes. It's also funny because uh, additive notation is very common with like plain elliptic curve groups. So like the groups, the elliptic curve math that we were talking about earlier, you do point plus point plus point plus point. And what we talk about scalar multiplication, because if you are adding a point to itself n times, you just represent that as little n times big P, and that little n is the scalar, and we call it scalar multiplication. So that's additive notation. You can get into, if you do pairing-based cryptography with, with elliptic curves, these all these things called like Miller loops and I've like done a Miller loop. I've used a Miller loop like exactly one time and I was like, I think I'm doing this right. Uh, like the Tate pairing and then this, that and the other thing. And it's like between one group and another group into another group. And there's a, they kind of need multiplicative notation because if you if you start with additive notation, like the math just gets unwieldy so fast. So I understand why they use multiplicative, but I lean towards additive for just regular schmegular elliptic curves. But I've yeah, I've seen both. It's a it's a very spaces versus tabs, Emacs versus Vim sort of thing, I think. I lived in finite field a lot finite field world a lot when I was doing this, so it was all multiplicative. We have a follow-up from Sophie who says that tensor product notation is clearly correct. And I don't even know what tensor product no notation looks like, but Sophie has explained multiple times how elliptic curve math is like the obvious math that comes out of using category groups to do abstract algebra or something like that. And she makes a very convincing argument that like, this is the like mathematically pure correct way <laughs> to represent these operations. And I'm just like, yes, I'm nodding. I don't really know what you're saying, but it sounds really mathematically elegant. <laughs> so <laughs> look, all I know is that when the tensors flow, people get really excited. Uh -huh. <laughs> all right. Uh, we've got 11 is the best prime. <laughs> That's false. Nine is the best prime. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> um, nine is not a prime. And I think we got one more take that we'll, we'll go along with. Uh, my hottest take, it's more likely that elliptic curve cryptos RSA are classically broken than we will ever have quantum computers capable of breaking them. This is, this is a good hot take. My first reaction is no to the elliptic curves and yes to the RSA. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I think well, that, like, okay. I don't know that we get, like, a polynomial time algorithm for factoring, but I could see us getting enough practical... Like, classical speed-ups for factoring. Yeah. Okay. That, uh, like, even 2048 RSA gets broken in the next, I don't know, 10, 20 years. Yeah. It hasn't been secretly broken. Especially my... because um, a lot of the, like like field sieve algorithms use like lattices or something like that like right mm -hmm. and i like there's so much research into lattices 
right now that that's kind of spurred by trying to get post quantum cryptography ready to go that uses lattices and like I think we talked to Chris Pikert a little bit about that, but but we we also know that there are like some people who are prohibited from publishing further research on factoring and lattices um because they did work with the government oh like we know that this is this oh. exists whether that actually turned into anything and that was a while ago but uh-huh. Like, uh-huh. huh so i, I, I totally that. not 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 necessarily speculating that like it's already broken or something but just mm-hmm. that i totally believe that there's speed ups on factoring yeah elliptic curves i'm more skeptical of yeah in terms of more likely classically broken than we'll ever, at least for, yeah, so let's say, at least for RSA classically broken than we will ever have for quantum computers capable of breaking. So one thing is that there's so much pure materials, physics, engineering that has to be like ironed out for real qubit quantum computers uh, that are yes. sufficiently large, sufficiently fault tolerant, sufficiently error correcting, blah, 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 that maintain yeah. coherence for long enough to run your quantum circuit however many times you need to run it to get your your full distribution, uh, blah, de, blah, de, blah, blah, um, blah. I was talking with, with uh, Nadia Henninger about yeah. this recently because she's on, I want to say an NSF something mm-hmm. about uh-huh. quantum computers, but there was an NSF report, I believe, like a year yes. ago or so um, about the feasibility of quantum computers. And the main was that they don't believe it's possible for China <laughs> to develop one without the U.S. Oh, knowing. yes. Yes, I remember so this. That's the key takeaway. Yes. But like the thing that Nadia drew it was, uh, was one, that was not clear that like current methods are going to scale. Mm. So, um, and two, uh, like, like you mentioned, and then... The other thing was, if you look back at, like, the development of regular computers, Mm -hmm. you had a very nice, like, virtuous cycle where, like, you got the starting computer, then you were, not only were you able to use that to make better computers, but also there is, like, clear applications of, like, Mm -hmm. early stage, what we would now consider to be very bad computers, Mm -hmm. either in scientific research or HR stuff, taxes, like, all that stuff, Mm -hmm. Um, all of the the used punch cards for... Mm -hmm. And then, you know, up through Unix, multi-user, the big rooms, the smaller, right? All of these things fed into each other. And, like, there were problems that existed in the world that, like, could not be solved and then could be solved when Mm -hmm. you created one. And the problem that quantum computers have is that all of the small ones are worse at solving (laughs) problems than regular computers already are. So there's, like, no virtuous cycle at all. I will. Because you can't do anything with a quantum computer until it's the one that lets you do everything. I will uh, play, I hate saying play devil's advocate. I will say that for the very beginning of regular digital computers, they were competing with humans doing math manually and you know with you know a calculator and and, you know an abacus and and, you know people doing algebra and calculus and stuff like that with their minds and pencils and rooms of them so like the manhattan project had rooms of ladies who would do calculations after you know a day of dudes doing physics in a room and be like ladies you know hello calculators please do some math for me and then they would they would spit out some math up to a point those women were better at doing math than the computers until they weren't. <laughs> so I see your point. I, I see the general point of like, they can't even like, what can they factor? It's like, oh, the, the 55 qubit quantum computer can factor 15. Oh man, like that's so exciting. It's like, yeah, well, you know, the early, early digital computers couldn't really do much of anything comparable to either a very good human computer or... Um, or a room full of them for a while. The kind of thing that I kind of want to get to is that there's a thing that a lot of people don't really see as like the kind of like third horse, which is that we have very large data centers that simulate quantum algorithms. They're classical data centers. They're very, very large and they are used to simulate quantum computers running quantum algorithms. And they are quite competitive. So like the, um, I think it was the Sycamore paper from Google where they're like, we are able to do something uh, with our, you know, physical quantum computer that, you know, a similar comparable classical data center trying to do the same thing 
only can't just do as good as us anymore. And like, we have tons of classical compute and we can get good results out of trying to simulate quantum algorithms with like huge amounts of classical computing. And that may be true for a while. Yeah, and it should be very clear, like what speed up you get there, right? Like you take your quantum algorithm and you apply a standard transformation that takes some amount of of algorithmic complexity to turn it into a final algorithmic complexity. Yeah. And, you know, some algorithms would be better or worse. You yeah. Know, and then the constants are going to be sneaky there, but like it should be pretty obvious. Like, yeah. What's a good candidate for that and what's not? And yeah. There's no way it's going to be everything. Yeah. And like, you know, some of the target problems that people like quantum computers for, like protein folding, complex weather simulations, nuclear simulations, things like that, that we have traditionally used like major, major, large, you know, supercomputers or huge data center compute to do may not translate well to a quantum algorithm simulated on a classical data center. I don't know enough about that to, to say, but I will say that for the near term, while we still have these, I forget the term, like the, the noisy something uh, intermediate scale quantum computers, which is like what we're going to have for the next, I don't know, 20 plus years. We still are worrying about these massive amounts of classical compute who can still do things very, very quickly when trained on a problem that we consider to be so far resistant to some of these attacks. So, <laughs> well, Deirdre, I'm being takes. told that real world crypto is, in fact, not a really bad MTV reality show. <laughs> And that it's happening soon. And in fact, you're in another country on another I continent. Am. And I will, um, I will clarify that there is real world crypto. There's also the Rugby World Cup. I am not in the country for the Rugby World Cup. So when you hashtag RWC, you have to be careful. <laughs> you have to caveat it and spell it all out. Real world crypto. Yes, I, I am on my first international trip since COVID times, I am stoked. I am in Amsterdam for Real World Crypto. I have live tweeted Real World Crypto for several years running. So for the first time in a while, live from Amsterdam, it'll be Real World Crypto in a couple of days. Yes. So everyone should follow Deirdre on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I am stoked. We have, I'm stoked to see people in real life that I've only seen online for several years. Um, we also look like we've got a pretty cool program. There will be online components to Real World Crypto, which is nice, not just in-person components for the people who are following along from not Amsterdam. All right, so there's three days of stuff. So we already talked about side channel attacks. There's a session on side channel attacks, including Spectre declassified. So we'll see if there's any updates on Spectre. I'm not really sure what's going to be declassified about that. <laughs> They're not that hard to mitigate what cryptographic library developers think about timing attacks. I wonder what that's about. Lend me your ears, passive remote s physical side channels on PCs, which sounds almost exactly what I was kind of saying, which is literally you put up, you slap like a EM sensor on the wall and like near your computer and you have, this is like a physical side channel. A uh, session on symmetric cryptography, uh, heavyweight versus lightweight, okay rugged pseudorandom permutations in their applications. I don't know what that means. We'll find out. Mm. Yeah, I don't know what rugged is. It's about doing cryptography on a Panasonic Toughbook. I see. I Cool. I <laughs> will learn some tips and tricks from that session or from that uh, talk. Cryptographic attacks on privacy. The first one is a legal one Ooh, from boy. the CDT. So that yeah. should be interesting. That'll be fun. And it will be fun because it's like this this plays into the threat model of what you're trying to deploy. All about that data towards a practical assessment of attacks on encrypted search. Cool. Sunny Kamara does a lot of research on this. I'm interested. Privacy attack on Swiss Post e-voting system. All these e-voting systems, like I, you know, it's mm -hmm. hard to do. Uh, you know who else has an e-voting system? Uh-huh. The IACR. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Helios? Is that uh, it? I don't know. I, I think it's just like uh, it's like hot crappers. Oh, really? Uh, like I don't, I, or just like a website, right? Like oh, okay. I mean, you can make fun of it, but at the end of the day, it just doesn't really matter. It, yeah, 
exposure notifications private in Linux. I am very interested in this because this is the Apple and Google uh, exposure notification protocol that they deployed that you may be using if you install your local health department's like COVID notification app. How do you deploy that and have observability into how it is performing in a yeah. private way? Like I this is the, a uh, good thing. The question of whether or not that ended up being helpful is very is interesting. I wonder if they have anything to show about that. I think I've seen. I got a couple of those exposure notifications, and there was not enough information in them to make them actionable. Yeah, I think it was like where where they were deployed in countries that had uh, their outbreaks under control to a level uh, not like the US yeah. they were somewhat helpful but uh, I think yeah, I think a lot of if us you also had access to testing at the time yes I guess by the time I started getting them like we had enough rapid tests yeah um, yeah that's when they that's when it actually because it's like a tool in the toolbox and if you if the rest if the rest of your uh, your pandemic response is just sort of like shrug emoji, you know, even some of the best intentioned, best designed tools can only go so far. Standard MPC for privacy measurement. Yep. Oblivious message retrieval. Shout out to Zcash researchers. This is a uh, Aaron Tromer is um, uh, worked on Zcash. I work on some Zcash stuff now. This is a cool technique to try to use uh, fully homomorphic encryption to let you figure out when you have encrypted payments on something like a blockchain without having to try literally every single encrypted payment to see if it decrypts to your private key because there's no other because it's private. There's no other way to figure out if you've got some payments on the blockchain without leaking some data about who you are and whether you've gotten some payments and stuff like that. On Thursday, TLS stuff, <laughs> justifying standard parameters in the TLS 103 handshake. <laughs> okay. Uh, Alpaca, application layer protocol confusion. I feel like we've heard about Alpaca. Oh, is that new? Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. Maybe um, this was at Black Hat at some point. Oh, Maybe it wasn't. Yeah. I don't know. That sounds familiar. Compression from Mike Hamburg. Cool. Useful primitives. <laughs> <laughs> Commit to acts of steganography before it's too late. This is Matt Green and some other. Oh, and uh, one of his student Gabriel. I'm interested in this. I don't know what it's about, but I am interested. Password-based key exchange storage hardening me on the client-server setting. Okay, I know that a lot of people are into pakes and they want nicer, better pakes. So this is Chip and Crisp. I am. I am interested to hear more. Huh. Rebuilding Meta's ad stack with multi-party computation from Meta, uh, a.k.a. Facebook. Interesting. Ooh, secure messaging. Secure messaging authentication against active man middle attacks. Okay. Continuous authentication and secure messaging. This is interesting because this is basically like in your signal setting, you verify your public keys with each other maybe the first time. You do your long-term public keys. And then like the way that the signal protocol does this is they do like a triple diffy helmet and you mix in contributor material from your long term keys and your ephemeral keys and it all gets chained together and you do hashing and things like that. And we all know three times the diffy helmet, three times the security. <laughs> yeah, sure. But like you rarely rekey in that setting. You just have like a long, long, long lived thing. Um, with new ephemeral keys and stuff like that. So it's interesting if they're they're trying to like analyze if you're updating continuously or, or whatever they're actually analyzing. Oh yeah, an evaluation of the risk of client-side scanning. We did an episode on Apple's client-side scanning proposal. With Matt Green, who might be giving this, who's one of the people listed yes. on this talk. So this may be more about that sort of thing not just the Apple one, but probably strongly informed by Apple's technical proposal that they have shelved. And we have not seen any evidence that they are taking it off the shelf uh, in the past, I don't know, six months. Four attacks and a proof for Telegram. Oh, boy. Is one of the attacks, it's in plain text mode. <laughs> <laughs> one of the attacks is literally everything is plain text except for when you like click five times into the send a private mm -hmm. message channel. So... Uh, making signal post quantum secure. I am always interested in this. I think I looked at this paper when it first came out, but I have not read the whole thing. So I'm interested in this. Let's see. Huh. Trust dies in darkness, shedding light on trust zone cryptographic design. It always well, What do we know? More microarchitecture side channels, we can only assume. <laughs> but it's 
it's not just micro directorial side channels. It's just like, can you do SGX and can you do trust zone in like a like actually secure manner? And it seems it seems very, very hard. And so, um, you know, one more chink in that sort of armor beyond the sort of like speculative execution side channels or local side buffer or side channels. On the insecurity of Elgabal and OpenPGP, like, stop. Stop using OpenPGP. <laughs> Like, you know, this is an, this might be an interesting analysis, but I'm just sort of like, why, why, like I, who is still using it? Please stop using it. Like, can we help you? Can I offer you a signal in these trying times? And like, it's, the answer is that does not always fit a scenario where you want to send, say, an encrypted email, but you know, like, can we talk to you? Can we, can we help you? Don't break the web APIs for Chrome's privacy sandbox. Oh boy. Discussions, other things. A concert by a band I'm not familiar with. And then the third day, quantum resistance security for software updates on low powered network embedded devices. Cool. All right. We need secure update channels. <laughs> Drive quantum safe. Uh, Post quantum security for vehicle to vehicle communications. Okay. It's vehicle to vehicle communications use really weird cryptography. They use like Why? quote unquote short lived certs. I mean, they, they all, they're all using like Are they NIST like... curves and so on, but like the design of the protocols is just very odd. And they're all those protocols that are uh, they're like IEEE stuff. So they're all the standards oh. you like pay money to access. So Ugh. most of the people that you would stereotypically think of as being in the cryptography community aren't really paying too much attention. Oh. EFF has an article about this somewhere. Oh, cool. Do car people just not think that the internet... What does IETF stand for? <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, the car people have been doing IEEE standards for, oh, for they, okay. longer than the IETF has existed. Then so. what? So they just sort of were like, oh, we've been doing this for a while, and they just ignore IETF crypto stuff? Well, they're doing standards for communicating between cars, so it's not clear that like okay. you would want to bring the IETF in. Fun. Ooh, this is, I am interested in this. Surviving the f Uh I'm pretty sure F-O here is Fujisoki Okamoto. I'm probably saying that wrong. Transform, securing PQC implementations in practice. So for the NIST post-quantum competition, a lot of the possible candidates for replacing key exchange did it fit into a Diffie Hellman ask key exchange API basically. They fit more into something that's called a, a key uh, encapsulation mechanism or chem. One way to make your thing look like a chem is to apply this FO transform. And so almost all of these chem candidates applied this transform to make it fit into this chem API. And apparently almost all of them did it wrong or badly or insecurely and so th this is why it's like the focopolis focopolis mm. uh, what's what's also kind of funny about this talk is this is the people listed here are all from nxp yeah and nxp also makes the chip makes a bunch of the chips for vehicle to vehicle communications <laughs> how convenient all right cryptographic transition threshold crypto and zero knowledge stuff Cool review on which a lot of zero knowledge proof Rust programmers use. It's a very nice ecosystem. If you're just trying to prototype your thing and you need some fields, some groups, some curves, stuff like that, that's where you go for ArcWorks. Decentralized private computations on Aleo. Cool. Snark pack. Practical snark aggregation. Co-authored by Mary Maller. I've worked with, uh, with Zcash stuff. Zero knowledge middle boxes and punctuable encryption, fine grained approach to forward secure encryption and more. Cool. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Looking forward to an in person component for real world crypto. And uh, I yeah. will be on the internet tweeting about it perhaps. And maybe I'll actually remember some of it. <laughs> real world crypto is great. I strongly recommend attending. It's probably the most approachable cryptography focused conference that I know of, whether you're approachable from the sense of coming from industry or even approachable just from if you're normally in, say, the non-cryptography security community, that was the one that I would try to go to back when I was doing academic work. And I'd probably be there this year, too, if it wasn't in Europe. 
Yes. I don't know when the next one is going to be, but it might come back to this. It, yeah. it, it rotates. So it historically it, has rotated West Coast, East Coast, Europe every three years. Yeah. So I think the next one, next 2023 will be, if in person, will be in North America. So yes, yay. Probably the Bay Area. Nice. I know they record stuff and they put it online. Um, you can attend remotely and log in. And that was how we did it last year. And that was fun, too. So you can do that. I think you have to go to the IACR website and uh, and yeah. sign up. Um, it starts on Wednesday. So Time zones make that a little difficult, but I yes. might be able to hop in for a session or two. Yes. Yay! Okay. <laughs> That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> all right. And then we have merch available. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and buy some merch. Oh, fuck! Uh, I forgot about the merch! Right. Merch.securitycryptographywhatever.com is up. You can buy hoodies, mugs, stickers, other things. I'm drinking out of one of the mugs right now. Nice. Um, and I can testify that it's great. Yes. And I have a fresh security cryptography black zip hoodie to add to my not at all large collection of black zip hoodies. So if you would like some merch, uh, you can get some nice merch. And we're vaguely working on more different types of merch besides black things with purple writing and cool art that evokes the hell that we find ourselves in and trying to create software. But yeah, merch.securitycryptographywhatever.com. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And as always, use fly.io for all your hosting <laughs> needs uh -huh. and pinboard.in for all your bookmarking needs. Uh-huh. <laughs> We are not sponsors. We just like them. Okay. Bye. I'm <laughs> hanging up.